A very good morning to you all. I welcome each one of you in this worship service at Hively Avenue Mennonite Church. It is a blessing to be here and fellowship with you all and worship our living God with you all. For today, for this Sunday, the theme is Jesus welcomes our questions and doubts, but also invites us to reach out and touch him, particularly his wounds. What does all that mean for us and our doubts? May this worship service be a blessing to each one of us. Amen. I would like to invite all of us to the call to worship. Please join me. We sing our praises, O God, and bless your name forever and ever. We come to the Lord just as we are. We thank you, O Lord, for your saving and forgiving grace. Amen. Shall we pray? Dear God, we come to your presence, our living God, our Redeemer, our Sustainer. We humbly come into your presence and we pray especially for this worship service today. May our singing, our reading of the word, prayers, listening from your word, fellowship, and everything that we do today may bring glory and honor to your holy precious name. We submit ourselves into your hands, O oh Father, and we pray that you please enable all of us to worship you in a spirit and in truth. In Jesus' mighty, precious name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us sing two hymns for the glory of God from Voices Together, hymn number 115, and another one from Voices Together is uh, hymn 67. Please stand, if able. Sixty-seven. We'll sing it in English through, 
And then uh, we'll also do it once through in Spanish. Notice the repeats in the middle as well as at the end. This is a uh, time for us to light the peace candle, and I invite uh, Rich to please come forward and lead us. It's painfully obvious that our, com that our country is experiencing deep, deep cultural and political divisions. I was reminded again of that again this past week when a co-worker wore a t-shirt that read, if you don't like Trump, you probably don't like me, and I'm fine with that. 
As tempting as it is to write off my co-worker, I think I and we need to take his shirt as a challenge. As followers of the one who commanded us to love our enemies, we need to continue to try to not only like, but love those we disagree with, despite their attempts to thwart us. Please join me in the litany in the bulletin as I light the peace candle. Together. God of peace, Christ of peace, Spirit of peace, you are calling us to be peacemakers. Today we light this candle as a reminder of our calling. This is a time for us for confession, to say that the Lord is our God, whom we believe. And I invite you all to please join me in the responsive reading at, in your bulletin. Jesus of Nazareth was a man commended, uh, commended to us by God. This man, according to the declared purpose and foreknowledge of God, was handed over, crucified, and killed by the hands of lawless ones. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore lifted high at the right hand of God, having received promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father, he has poured out that we both see and hear. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us sing another hymn for the glory of God. In thee is gladness. Hymn number 666 from Voices Together. This is time for our children to be blessed, and Kathy has prepared something for the children, so I invite all the kids, children, to please come forward and be blessed by the children's time.
it's on now. <laughs> I have a question for you this morning. Have you ever gotten into a fight with a friend of yours? No. Yeah. Well, that's, well good. I'm so glad to hear that. <laughs> okay. And maybe even your best friend? Maybe? Yeah. And there were mean words, maybe, and maybe someone did something that was made somebody else sad or well, I, hurt? I, I, I put Norman with a best friend. <laughs> <laughs> this house with my work, but in this place, but we want to fight. Okay. Well, I'm so glad that you and your best friend get along so well. That is so neat, Shanice. And, but you know, sometimes we don't get along that well. well every once in a while, not very often, and you know what? My friends Ryan and Carlos got into a big fight. And it wasn't a good time to be in a big fight because, I, if, for those of you who know, uh, when I talk about Ryan and Carlos, they love soccer. They love soccer. They're on a soccer team together. They love playing. They love going to the high school games. And they even watch soccer on TV. And their favorite player on TV is a guy named J uh, Jordan Morris. And he plays for the Team USA, and he's really good. And one day they found out that jo Jordan Morris was coming to their town. And they were so excited, and they wanted to see Jordan Morris. He was going to come for an interview and a, sp and a soccer camp for one day. But there weren't a lot of tickets available, because everybody wanted to see Jordan Morris. But Carlos's dad knew a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy and they got tickets. And so for a whole month they were talking about, they were gonna see Jordan Morris, they were gonna to talk to Jordan Morris, they were gonna play soccer, they were gonna get a picture with Jordan Morris. They were so excited. But then, four days before Jordan Morris came to town, they got into a big fight. And it was over something silly. It's always over something silly. It was over like, whose legs were longer or whose hair grew the fastest or it, I don't even remember I just know it was silly and they didn't talk to each other for two whole days yeah and then on the third day Ryan started thinking Jordan Morris is coming in two days what if Carlos is so mad at me he's not going to take me to see Jordan Morris and then his mind started going in, in really bad directions, and he was like, well, maybe Carlos isn't really my friend. Maybe Carlos doesn't really like me. And he went to mom, and he said, I I'm worried about this, and mom said, oh, no, no. Carlos would never do that. You know Carlos is a good friend. But that day, that day, Ryan got a call from Carlos on the phone, and it was a strange call, because Carlos said, I'm sorry, man, we can't go see Jordan Morris. We have a family emergency. I'm sorry, man, and he hung up. And that's all he said. So Ryan went to mom and he said, what is this about? And, and mom said, hey, if there's a family emergency, probably he couldn't talk. He was probably in a hurry. So she called Maria, his mother, and nobody answered the phone. And all day, Ryan's stomach hurt. He got angry. He got sad. He got upset. He couldn't even sleep that night. But the next day, mom got a call from Maria. And she said, Ryan, you know what happened? He said, Carlos Abuela, Ramona, she had a heart attack. Now, a heart attack is when your heart it, it, uh, has a sickness or something and it doesn't work quite right, and they have to take you to the hospital so the doctors can fix that because hearts are very important. And so Abuela, Grandma Ramona, was in the hospital, and the family was up there with her to make her feel safe and loved, and that's where they were. Well, then, nothing Nothing makes you forget about an argument and mean words like your best friend's grandma being sick in the hospital. So Ryan said, can we go see her? And mom said, yes, we'll keep praying. And when she's well enough, you can go up to the hospital and see her. And in two days, they could go up to the hospital. And they took a card and flowers and a big yellow smiley balloon that said, get well soon. So when Ryan got in the room, then he believed. He saw uh, that uh, Abuela uh, uh, Ramona was good, and he believed. Now, when we believe things that we can't see, that's called faith. And faith is a good thing. And it would have been nice if Ryan would have believed Carlos and had faith in him. But you know what? That's the way we are. 
We do stuff like that sometimes, you know. Um, today, Pastor Tim is going to tell you a story from the Bible, and it's about a good friend of Jesus, and his name was Thomas. My daddy. Yeah, your daddy. <laughs> and he's going to tell us a story about a time when Thomas didn't believe what Jesus' friends told him about Jesus. He said, you know what? I won't believe that unless I see that with my own eyes. So I'd like you to listen very carefully today and see if Thomas is able to believe. Okay? Are there any questions about the story today? Yes. Do you have a question? Is love a important thing? Yes, love is a, a beautiful and an important thing. And love is something that helps us to believe, isn't it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Any other questions today? Yes, Shanice. Did Jesus die because we could be friends with God? That's, that is well put. Jesus died so we could be friends with God. And boy, if that isn't faith, isn't that something to believe in that we can't see? I have a question. Do you guys believe that your mom and dads love you? Yeah. Me too. I believe that they love you more than anything. Yeah. How do you know that, though? Yeah, you don't. Faith. You did. What's that? Faith. Faith. Yeah, faith. Because they tell you, right? And they show you loving things. Faith is right. Yes. Good job, Everett. Okay. So we are going to say a prayer. And after that, I, I got you a little reminder of sometimes seeing is believing. And there's plenty of these. So I've got sunglasses because we want to protect those eyes, okay? So we're going to say the prayer, and then you can all come and choose a pair of sunglasses to remind you. Now, they got stickers on them, so be sure to take the stickers off or you're going to run into something, all right? <laughs> okay, let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you that we can believe you, and we pray that all of these children can have faith and believe that you love them so much that you sent Jesus so we could be friends with God. Lord God, we pray your blessing and your protection over these children because we love them and we know you love them even more. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, come and get your sunglasses. There's lots. Oh, those are pretty. Is there one you like? Yeah, that'll go good. Everybody get one? Right, thank you so much for your help. You may go back to your seat. This is time for a scripture reading, and uh, I invite uh, Swen to please come forward and lead us. The scripture portion is John 20, verse uh, 24 to 31. Tomas, alke apudaban in Gamelo, y que era uno de los dos, no estaba con los discípulos cuando llegó Jesús. Así que los otros discípulos le dijeron, hemos visto al Señor. Mientras no vea, yo la marca de los clavos en sus manos y meta mi dedo en las marcas y, y mi mano en su costado, no lo creé. Repuso Tomás. Una semana más tarde estaban los discípulos de Nueva en casa y Tomás estaba con ellos, aunque las puertas estaban cerradas. Jesús entró y, poniéndose en medio de ellos, los saludó. La paz sea con ustedes. Luego le dijo a Tomás, Pon tu dedo aquí y mira mis manos. Acerca tu mano y métela en mi costado. Y no seas incrédulo, sino hombre de fe. Señor mío y Dios mío, exclamó Tomás. Porque me has visto, has creído, le dijo Dios. Dichochos los que no han visto y sin embargo creen. Jesús hizo muchas otras señales milagrosas 
en presencias de sus discípulos, las cuales no están registradas en este libro, pero estas se han escrito para que ustedes crean que Jesús es el Cristo, el Hijo de Dios, y para que al creer en su nombre tengan vida. La palabra, la palabra de Dios. Gracias a Dios. I'll be reading the passage in English, which is John chapter 20, verse 24 to 31. And here it says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands and, imprint, uh, and the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger, and see my hands. And reach here with your hands, and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see me and yet believed. Therefore, Many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. May the Lord bless his word. May I request Pastor Tim to please come forward and bless us with the word and the thought that the Lord has given to him for all of us to be blessed with. I don't know how many of you saw what's actually on the table here. It's actually a game that Annie found, a children's game, called Ants in Your Pants. This is great. You see the, uh, you see the little bear over here, the panda, and what you do is you take the little ant and you touch his backside and, whoops, oh. There you go. Didn't quite make it, but there you go. Ants in your pants. I, uh, the, that phrase, I looked it up. I don't know that others of you from other cultures are familiar with that phrase. I grew up with it. My grandpa would accuse me of having ants in my pants. And it, not really known where it came, comes from. I suspect it came from some people having a picnic sometime, and there got to be a lot of ants around, and some of them got into somebody's pants. It just means that when you get something like ants in your pants, they agitate you. You move, you do something about it, and in a weird and likely uncomfortable way, you become much more alive. <laughs> so good old Frederick Buechner, one of my favorite writers, as you know, wrote this is the, is the role of doubts in relationship to faith. Whether your faith is that there is a God or that there is not a God, if you don't have any doubts, you are either kidding yourself or asleep. Doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. They keep it alive and moving. Is that the role of doubt with faith? Are questions to be encouraged? Are doubts to be explored? Well, at some level they will be, whether they are supposed to be or not. But we can also ask, because it probably comes to some of our minds, is scripture also contradictory about this? Jesus welcoming, quote-unquote, doubting Thomas 
while James 1, 5 through 8 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So is the Apostle James, is the Bible saying, don't have any doubts or questions, and if you do, don't expect to have your prayers answered? That seems unlikely, since Jesus seems to welcome the disciples' questions and doubts, and the questions of doubts of others, especially sincere seekers, throughout his ministry. And though he sometimes chides the disciples for lacking faith, he usually uses their questions and doubts for teachable moments and seems to accept these questions and doubts as a part of being human. So what's going on later with the Apostle John, James? It's one of those cases, I think, where context and translation means a lot. If you go into the book of James, we find he is not primarily addressing intellectual or even heartfelt questions of faith, but questions of allegiance. And if we doubt our allegiance to the values of God's reign, that is where we become double-minded and blown about like the wind. The Greek word uh, used in James for doubt, I never pronounce it correctly, I'm sure, diakrino, has more to do with options of allegiance than intellectual doubt or heartfelt questions. In my head, I can question and doubt almost everything. Does God exist? What does it mean for Jesus to be fully human and fully divine? How literal is the resurrection? And having gone to seminary and taken classes on it, I still ask myself those questions with regularity. In my heart, I struggle with sincere questions. How do I wrestle with scripture in relationship to violence and abuse? Why do a couple of my friends seem to have experienced so much of abuse and betrayal in their lives and so little love? How do I relate lovingly and faithfully to my children and friends who struggle with questions of faith even more than I do? What are the ants in your pants of faith? When I struggle with any of these questions, I actually, in a strange way, often experience a sense of God's love moving toward me with compassion. But when I began choosing something different than the way of God's reign, the way of love shown in Jesus, and begin chasing after wealth and fame, begin being willing to exploit and abuse others for my own gain, even if in very small ways of just being selfish, begin trusting violence over the way of love, then I become profoundly decentered, unstable, and double-minded. I believe God, as seen in Jesus, welcomes those first kinds of doubting and question, just as Jesus did with Thomas more than once. Earlier in the Gospel of John, Thomas has another exchange with Jesus where doubt and questions come into play. In John 14, verses 2 through 6, it says this, Jesus is speaking, in my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. And I love it. Thomas says, uh, Lord, actually, we don't know where we're, you're going and we don't know how to get there. <laughs> then Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus welcomes Thomas' doubts and questions earlier and also in the post-resurrection encounter. But then it comes back and addresses them at a deeper level. And how does Jesus do that, especially in this post-resurrection challenge? He says, hey, Thomas, what you talked about, put your finger here. See my hands. Look closely, touch them. Reach out and put your hand in where the sword pierced my side. Touch my points of suffering. Touch my woundedness. Look closely at them, enter into them, touch me. Sometimes doubts are resolved by better arguments. I manage to verbally convince you of something. 
But the older I get, the more I realize that actually resolves only some questions and doubts. But experiencing something deeply moving, touching something, entering into something we haven't known before, entering into a deep relationship with someone or a group of people, those are experiences that both resolve questions and doubts and often raise new ones, but on a kind of growth projection. And often with doubts at both a head and heart level, the way we come to know Jesus and God is by entering into what Jesus cares about, into what wounds Jesus. I have seen people have intellectual doubts still unresolved. Of course, that goes, I do. But what they have experienced of God's love through someone who touched their wounds, who entered into their places of suffering, have found faith, found Jesus, and found love. How has that happened to me? How about to you? How about among us? We live in a society that largely wants to avoid suffering. Even the suffering of disease and dying that all humans are bound to go through. Let alone the suffering that is called voluntary suffering. Where we actually choose to sacrifice something or suffer willingly for the sake of others. But that is part of what I believe Jesus is inviting us into at a sensory level. And to get to know Jesus personally in the place, in the place that people are hurting and among the marginalized and their stories. This week, there were two stories in Anabaptist world that I found touched on this. One is how touching Jesus' wounds impacted a girl when she was age seven. And the other, how touching Jesus' wounds currently in Ukraine is changing lives and building faith. Teresa Eshelman, who I think I have met once, recalls how her family and faith community's response to an automobile accident involving her oldest sister, Pauline Holsoppel, and Pauline's two children shaped Teresa's commitment to faith. Now, I've only met Teresa once, but Pauline I know. She's a member at Maplewood Mennonite Church in Fort Wayne, and when I served there as interim pastor, I got to know Pauline and her husband fairly well. Now, why did this impact Teresa's faith? The, because the experience I'm going to tell you about she saw her faith community and that of her sisters come together in deep love, both in prayer and action. While her niece and nephew sustained only minor injuries, her sister Pauline was seriously injured. And Teresa writes, she emerged from surgery in a coma on life support and with a death certificate completed to need only the date and time. Then she goes on to write, Few par just several paragraphs that I will read to you. The article in Anabaptist World, by the way, is called The Miracle We Didn't Pray For. She says, suddenly, after her sister emerged, uh, came out of the surgery in a coma, suddenly I started paying more attention to this prayer idea and to what the adults were doing. Teresa was age seven at the time. It was impossible not to. Prayers were everywhere in earnest. Prayers over the phone, in circles, holding hands, on knees, in church, in the car, in the hospital lobby and chapel with close family, extended family. People were praying all the time, everywhere. Announcements to pray were made in all the area, Sunday Mennonite churches, Sunday school classes, and Bible study groups. As hope dimmed, the prayers intensified. Pauline was surrendered into God's hands, an anointing service was planned. Although healing could have been the point of the anointing service, surrender was the focus. As we gathered, it was clear, even to me at seven, that God's will was the only desire. As we gathered in prayer, anointed and released Pauline to God, family visited her bedside for what would likely be the last time. But as each person came out of her room, they related seeing a small sign of life. An eyelid flickered, a finger moved. There seemed to be a slight shudder through her body. The next morning, Pauline was no longer in a coma. By the following week, she was taken off life support and returned home. 
Baffled doctors said she would make a complete recovery. God showed up in a big way through the healing of Pauline's body. God also showed up in all sorts of little ways. Joining in with the church friends and family as we prayed, sang, read scripture, cooked together, baked, cleaned, babysat, told stories, colored pictures, played games, searched for lost toys, tucked kids into bed. All made a lasting impression of God in action. Faith shows up and does whatever is needed, even what is needed is sitting quietly with someone as they have a good cry. These are the small miracles that sustain faith. What I experienced at seven has been the foundation of my faith as an adult. Yes, there was the big miracle, unexpected miracle of healing that was a central feature. But so was being brought into the faith lives of the adults around me. And even that story leaves the question of why are some healed and others not? We don't know that mystery. We, don't, we have questions and doubts about all of that. But that sustaining faith community of people acting together, praying together, that so many of us experience. In Ukraine, a, bre- a Mennonite brethren young man named Rostik recalls a local church supporting his single mother and he and his brothers when he was young, and it changed the course of his life. And now he is spending his time volunteering, providing for the needs of people who have been injured or displaced by the current war. When I was young and started to attend church, the church supported me and my family, and it drastically changed my life. Remembering how church influenced my life and faith then, and now I see families who are in need. So I have a a chance to share or to give something to people in need now. I want to do that. Emily Lowen, who wrote the article, says, In Ukraine, there's the military front line that everyone hears about in the news. But churches here see their own front line as providing relief and care for people who have been displaced and harmed by war. And I have personally no doubt that these actions will, for at least a few, address their questions of faith and doubt better than any intellectual arguments. So how do I respond? How do you respond? I find this to be the most challenging aspect of faith because there's a good chance it will be uncomfortable, possibly even hurt, and usually it will challenge and change me. It does. Like most human beings, I'm not a big fan of change. I used to think I was. You know, I was a change agent. (laughs) Then came to realize I'm only a fan of change if it happens to be change I want, or change I can exert some control over. (laughs) Otherwise, not so much. (laughs) Where are the places I need to go? The places I need to see and be present to touch the woundedness of Jesus? I'm pretty convinced that for me, the new Tolson Center is going to be one of those, though I'm not certain it will be the only one. Where are those for you? Where are those for us collectively? I'm always willing to talk about faith with people struggling with belief and faith, and I find I don't need to argue so much anymore. I'm not so much trying to convince them as listen for where God might be trying to encounter both of us in the discussion and what is happening in our lives. Where might be Jesus inviting me or them to touch his wounds and come close? that kind of encounter will be more transformative to questions and doubt than arguments that I might make or evidence I might present. I love the last line in today's scripture passage. These, referring to the stories in the gospel, are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. What we have here including the doubts of Thomas and Jesus' challenge to touch him and his wounds, are here so that we may continue to believe, to put our trust in, give our allegiance to Jesus as the Messiah, the one who reveals God most fully. And because of that, have life, 
purpose, vision, animation. Be animated by that purpose and vision. And with that life and animation, I suspect that we will continue to have ants in our pants from time to time. May it be so. Amen. I invite us to stand, and Chris will come and lead us in 345, the risen Christ in Voices Together. to a time of sharing joys and concerns and also responses to what has taken place in worship today. So I invite you to